Okay, then we'll make a start. Um, good afternoon. My name is Matthew Moss. I'm a, uh, a historian that focuses on small arms. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about the Vickers machine gun and indirect fire. Uh, but I'm also a member of the uh, Vickers MG uh, Research Collection and Association, which is the organization which has put on today's event. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I want to talk about today is um, the, the importance of the Vickers machine gun and its main party trick, which is essentially indirect fire. Um, and first, before I begin, I'll talk a little bit about what the Vickers uh, is and how it works. So uh, the Vickers gun is a water-cooled, belt-fed, recoil-operated uh, machine gun, uh, and it's capable of firing around 500 rounds per minute um, for a prolonged period. And that's where it becomes extremely useful in this indirect fire role. Uh, it first entered service with the British Army in 1912, uh, uh, succeeding the, the Maxim gun. And it uh, was primarily used as a direct and indirect support weapon. So what is indirect fire? Now, this is a, um, a really simple diagram from a British Army small arms training manual. Uh, and unlike direct fire, where the weapon is aimed directly at its target, indirect fire sees the gun aimed almost like a howitzer, like artillery. And the rounds will be fired in an arc over the battlefield, down onto their target. And we can see this in the diagram. Um, more often than not, the target that the guns were aimed at couldn't be seen directly from the gun. Um, and they were normally enveloped by what was known as a beaten zone of the rounds falling in the area that the target was, was placed at. Typically, the aim was not to solely kill the enemy, but it was to interdict their movement, uh, keep them pinned down, and basically harass them. So, into the crucible of the First World War, this is where the Vickers comes into its own. At the start of the First World War, the British Army, uh, the infantry battalions were equipped with just two machine guns, Maxims and then Vickers, when they became available. And it's fair to say that the capabilities of the Vickers had not yet been fully realized. Um, by the end of the war, however, an expert corps of machine gunners, uh, adapt, um, aptly called the Machine Gun Corps, <laughs> uh, had been formed. And the machine gun became one of the weapons which dominated the battlefield. And of course, it's the Vickers and uh, the German Maxim are synonymous now with, with the First World War. Uh, let's see. The Machine Gun Corps itself was raised to provide an, a skilled corps of machine gunners uh, that could support the British Army in the field, but they also helped shape the doctrine uh, of the gun's use as well. While the concept of indirect fire wasn't new, it had initially emerged during the Russo-Japanese War uh, in 1904-1905, and the British Army had had uh, people in the field observing this conflict. And They'd reported back on this, but it wasn't fully adopted into the British Army until during the actual First World War. Um, the idea wasn't fully embraced, in fact, until 1916. And the exact science behind indirect fire is quite complicated, um, a little too complicated for me to go into in depth today. So I would highly recommend that you, uh, I think of, uh, somewhere, and definitely on uh, the Vickers MGC, uh, Association's website, there is a fantastic new edition of the Vickers machine gun, the Pride of the MGs, and there is an entire chapter that goes into depth on how indirect fire works. But to sum it up, the methods used by the artillery were examined by uh, members of the machine gun corps, uh, and they were transferred across to the Vickers gun. Um, this meant that they took uh, not only the techniques that the artillery had developed for firing at targets in, in uh, an extreme range and out of sight. Uh, it also meant that some of the equipment that they used came across as well. So things like a, 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 a clinometer, difficult to pronounce, but uh, a, clino a clinometer, um, which was used to measure the angle that the gun was set up on, on its, uh, its tripod. So um, for visible targets, a range fire could be used, uh, typically uh, a bar and stroud. There is actually one outside, a uh, World War II uh, model, which was used during the Second War. Um, and these were used to measure the distance of targets which could be observed. And if they couldn't see the target itself, which was often the case, um, for indirect fire, what they would do is 
they would conduct the fire by maps or fire charts. Uh, and it became a bit of an, an exact science in this regard. Indirect fire was so important to the British Army that during the Machine Gun Corps officer training course, uh, a total amount of at least uh, a good portion of the last two weeks of an eight-week course were dedicated across to it. Um, so it was an extremely important aspect for the officers in the Machine Gun Corps to understand and be able to direct their fire in a, in a very targeted manner. Perhaps the most famous use of, the, uh, of indirect fire came during the Somme, uh, when the 100th Machine Gun Corps fired just short of around 100,000 rounds um, at high wood. Now, this is often cited as being 1 million rounds, um, fired in about 12 hours of fire. Uh, but uh, Rich Fisher, our director of the association, has done some research on this, looked into the logistics. Um, and while the original account from the 100th Machine Gun Company's uh, commander uh, states that they had men working round the clock to fill belts using up all available water. The logistics behind that, keeping the, that company of 16 guns um, filled with water, filled with ammunition, is just too much. And looking back through war diaries, we've, been man we've managed to work out that just short of 100,000 rounds, I think it was 95,200 um, which were, were fired during that 12 hours, which is no less impressive in my book. I think, I think that's uh, not quite a million, but still 100,000 rounds from one company is, is quite something. Um, the company's commander on the day described that barrage as being annihilating. So I've got a little clip here from, uh, this is from Kitchener's Great Army, a, uh, a Malins film. And we can see uh, a number of Vickers guns being set up here. Um, there's the tripod being set up. And then we get some great footage of some chaps engaged in barrage fire. So you can see here the angle that the guns were set up on. And this would have been fired at around 2,000 yards maximum. Uh, a year later, uh, during the Battle of Vimy Ridge, an even larger barrage was undertaken uh, with the entire Canadian Machine Gun Corps joined by elements of the British Army's Machine Gun Corps to muster some 230 Vickers guns firing in support of an attack on the ridge. No less than five million rounds were stockpiled for the guns for this operation. So moving on, pepper pots. Anyone know what a pepper pot is? Anyone heard that term before? No? Well, you'll find this next bit fairly informative then, hopefully. So during the Second World War, um, the, the Vickers came back into its own, essentially. And indirect fire became even more sophisticated uh, with specialist uh, equipment developed. This photograph shows uh, some of the first Manchesters in Malaya in 1941. Um, they're not engaged in indirect fire here, but it's a great photograph, and I couldn't really resist putting it in. So after the end of the First World War, uh, the Machine Gun Corps was disbanded in 1922. In fact, it was the centennial of that disbandment yesterday. Uh, and that's what this series of uh, events uh, has been to commemorate. Uh, the expertise and doctrine that the Machine Gun Corps developed during the First War was retained. Uh, that corporate knowledge was, was maintained. Um, and in 1937, it was decided to, to reform some dedicated battalions of machine gun um, armed units. The machine gun battalions were formed, and they saw action throughout the Second World War. The Vickers and its capability to direct indirect fire once again came into its own, and the development of new and improved rounds, such as the Mark 8Z, saw the range of the guns actually increased to 4,500 yards. This allowed the range of the guns to be kept, sorry, this range allowed the guns to be kept well back from the immediate front line, allowing them to drop fire onto enemy positions without themselves being uh, in immediate danger from, from uh, counter-battery fire. The new ammunition, coupled with new equipment, such as the, the dial sight, which you'll see on a number of the guns outside. There's one at the, the top of the stairs there um, with a dial sight, and there's a 1960s example as well upstairs. Um, with the dial sight mounted. These enabled the machine gun battalions to accurately pour supporting fire uh, from a considerable distance. 
This photograph shows a section of the second Middlesex Regiment during uh, Operation Market Garden uh, at the Mashfield Canal uh, on the 20th of September. So here you can see there are a section of four guns. It was four guns per section. And they're all equipped with the dial sight. So you can see the dial sight, which is just, just on the top of the side of the gun there. Uh, and that allowed indirect fire aiming to be done uh, with a little more ease than uh, using a clinometer. So the barrages would be pre-planned and coordinated on a map or fire control chart. The, the guns would be set up to create uh, an overlapping uh, beaten zone encompassing the targets. Uh, depending on the range and, um, and the, the terrain, this beaten zone could span up to about 300, 400 yards, depending on, um, depending on, again, range. But the main thing with the beaten zone is that was kept under constant fire. So enemy forces within the area, the movement was interdicted and harassed. So while uh, an artillery barrage might be more targeted at targets, the, the Vickers uh, and its indirect role aim to keep a certain area under constant long-term interdiction. Perhaps the most significant use of indirect fire with the Vickers came in March 1945 with uh, Operation Veritable, part of the uh, Western Allies' invasion of Germany. During the Rhineland campaign, the guns carried out a type of bombardment called the pepper pot. Uh, as part of preliminary bombardments by artillery, these pepper pots were organized to include all available firepower from the division. They consisted of the division's machine gun battalion um, and their three uh, companies, uh, as well as mortars and other elements such as anti-aircraft guns and anti-tank weapons as well. These weapons were the pot and the fire that they poured was the pepper and the, the Vickers gun provided the smallest grains of that pepper that they were sprinkling onto enemy targets. The task was to thoroughly saturate uh, enemy positions and defences before the launch of the attack. During Veritable, 96 Vickers guns on the left flank of the front line fired a total of 1.3 million rounds during the initial bombardment of enemy positions. The water-cooled Vickers was well suited to this and fire could be kept up for a significant amount of time. As long as the guns were fed with ammunition and water to keep them cool, uh, they could keep up a barrage rate of 25 rounds every 30 seconds until the guns had to be checked at 10,000 rounds. So at 10,000 rounds, the guns would be checked and their barrels would be changed. Uh, during the first war, it was found that any gun that had fired more than 8,000 rounds, it was best not to be used for indirect fire, especially in terms of what was known as overhead fire. Overhead fire typically was fired over the heads of troops. So they found that barrels that were a little more worn, it was probably a better idea not to use those when, in, when friendly troops were in the, almost in the line of fire. So with overhead fire, which was used uh, during both wars, the rounds would fire over the battlefield and arc just as they do with, with, um, with indirect fire. Um, but of course, it's covering an advance of troops in contact. 30 Corps' after action report uh, on Veritable noted, all accounts show that the pepper pot justified the apparent heavy expenditure of ammunition and was a definite factor in the success of the general fire plan. So it was believed that it wasn't the size of the shells that were falling on the enemy, but the number of rounds and the prolonged amount of fire that was falling onto them that they were key. So in this clip here, sadly we have no sound, um, is from a newsreel. And it shows what one of these pepper pots would have been like. So this was filmed during Operation Veritable um, in March 1945. So here you can see uh, some of the Vickers guns in action with indirect fire. And then they're coupled with the other elements of the division's firepower. So 40 millimeter Bofors would have been used, 75 millimeter anti-tank guns, any attached armor, 75 millimeter guns on Shermans and, and other British tanks would have been used. As well as, there's a really great clip at the end of this of some um, self-propelled uh, <coughs> archer uh, anti-tank uh, anti guns as well. There we go. Okay. 
So, Lieutenant Colonel E.G. Johnson, commander of the Toronto Scottish, uh, a, a machine gun battalion with the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division, organized their division's pepper pot fire plan. He later explained that the fire was to be as irregular as possible. The effect of having deliberate erat erratic fire uh, come down meant the enemy could not know when it would stop and when it would start. And this had the desired effect of reducing his morale. It served as a strong deterrent to free movement by the enemy. Johnson described many of the prisoners captured by the division's initial advance, advance uh, as being completely addled by the bombardment. Indeed, the Canadian Army's first intelligence report noted that captured German troops said the bombardment put a prolonged strain on the nerves. They had an impression of an overwhelming force opposed to them, which to their isolated state they felt was useless to resist. Um, last spring, we had the opportunity to recreate uh, a section of Vickers machine guns firing in the field, and we got some great footage. Now, again, there's no sound in this because we don't have sound, but at the end, if you want to make machine gun noises, you can do. So <laughs> this shows a section of four uh, Vickers machine guns dug in, as they would have been on the day during the battle. Oh, we have sound. So, didn't get to hear your machine gun sounds, but never mind. Um, basically, what this drone footage shows, if we play that again, is the four guns dug in as they would have been in the V-shaped slit trenches with overhead cover as well. Um, and this is fairly typical. They're spaced at 25 yards, as they would have been. And on the day, we were firing blank, just as a demonstration. And that's why we have some of these stoppages, because the blank didn't quite have the, the power to drive through uh, the belts, which are a little bit swollen from the rain on the day. So to compare that, we have a photograph from the actual operation itself, and you can see just how close we managed to, to recreate those positions. So you've got the overhead cover there at the back. You've got the chap manning the gun with the dial sight on the side there. You've got lots and lots of empty belts from the barrage fire that's going on and you've got his number two there feeding the belts from the side. The machine gun battalions continued to support the advance through the Rhineland, um, and several weeks later, the Pepper Pop bombardment, ahead of the launch of Operation Plunder, saw the 2nd Battalion Middlesex Regiment fire a total of 304,000 rounds during one bombardment. Um, during the fighting near Emmerich, the battalion's machine gun companies fired a staggering 675,000 rounds during four days of continuous slow rate fire. By the end of this, the battalion's official history noted that some of the guns were almost falling to pieces. Lieutenant Reginald Fendick, a, can loan, uh, a Canadian officer on loan to the, uh, the 2nd Middlesex, recalled in his book, which we have copies of um, on the association's uh, website, which we just reprinted, um, recalled that the guns were only out of action while moving to a new position. Night and day, there have been shoots, reckeys, and moves over tracks deep in mud a lot of shelling and mines all over the place, and the rain had been continuous. So it's very difficult circumstances to be operating under. And you can see a little bit of this from this photograph. It's, it's quite, quite muddy. Um, Pepper Butt Barrage, in support of plunder, the operations across the Rhine uh, included three machine gun battalions, a tank battalion, two anti-tank battalions, and three light anti-aircraft battalions. So those would have been the, uh, the 30, the, the 40 millimeter bofors that you, you saw in that clip earlier. Uh, these were all tasked with firing on German positions, and this amounted to some 22 75 millimeter tank, tank guns, 48 17 pounder anti-tank guns, 72 bofors guns, 36 4.2 inch mortars, and 108 Vickers machine guns. So that gives you an idea of the truly huge volume of fire that's involved with these pepper pot bombardments. So moving on, the Korean War. The Korean War is, is sort of the, the last hurrah of the Vickers in the indirect fire um, role. And here we've got a, uh, a gun from the, the Royal Ulster Rifles, 
uh, in Korea in, I believe, 1951-52. At this point, um, the machine gun battalions have been disbanded once again. And after the Second World War, those dedicated battalions were re-rolled back to infantry. Uh, and the Vickers machine guns were reallocated to the support companies of those battalions. Uh, each support company had a six-gun medium machine gun platoon, so that's a massive reduction of firepower from those machine gun battalions. Uh, but the idea was that it would be a more uh, organic support they could call on at, at the battalion level rather than brigade or division. Um, but in 1947, the guns themselves were actually removed uh, from service with the regular army. Of course, they were retained with the territorials. Um, but this rapidly changed in 1950 uh, with the outbreak of the Korean War. And it was quickly realized that there was a weight of fire needed for the kind of operations they were engaged in, um, many of them relatively defensive in nature, with what were regularly termed as human wave attacks by the Chinese, although um, the technique that they used was more of a focused movement of manpower into a certain area rather than just a generic human wave. Um, the training manuals for the Vickers have been rewritten after the war, and they've been simplified somewhat. So this meant that a lot of the indirect fire corporate knowledge from the, the machine gun battalions was, wasn't included in those manuals. Um, but with, with troops on the ground in Korea, uh, it was quickly realized and requests were sent back asking that indirect fire be uh, reintegrated into the training course for the Vickers gun. Um, so the techniques were reappraised and added back into a new set of manuals which were prepared uh, in 1951. So here we've got a photograph of the first uh, King's Own Scottish borderers training on a Vickers in Korea. Um, and you can see again that that dial sight is mounted. And whenever you see the dial sight mounted, that's a, a clear indication that indirect fire is, is the role that they're tasked with rather than a direct support. Of course, during the Korean War, there was plenty of direct fire support that was provided by these, uh, these support companies of the medium machine guns, um, which involves firing directly at the enemy rather than indirectly. The Vickers gun was put to good use at the Battle of Injun River by the Gloucesters. Similarly, the Duke of Wellington's regiment, um, their machine gun support platoon was used uh, in the indirect fire role at the Battles of the Hook, the second and third Battles of the Hook in 1952 and 53. This is a great colorized photograph of the, uh, the second Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry in March 1951. And you can see here the difficulty they had in actually digging the guns into positions due to the frozen um, ground. So they've they basically dug themselves a scrape and they're having a, a nap. Um, judging by the amount of spent uh, brass beneath the gun, uh, it looks like they've, they've earned the nap. Um, the Vickers was used by other Commonwealth nations uh, during the, the Korean War as well, uh, the Australians and of course the Canadians. Um, with accounts of the 2nd Battalion Princess, uh, Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry uh, using indirect fire at the Battle of Cap, um, Cap Yong. Korea represented one of the last times that the Vickers was used in the indirect fire role, um, but it did remain in British service alongside its successor, the L7 GPMG, until 1968. Um, and some corps had them retained in, in store until the early 70s. So there we go. That was. That's indirect fire with the Vickers gun. Uh, if you have any questions, I can try and answer them. And if I don't know the answer, I will refer you to someone who does. So um, from the same Malins film, I don't have it with me, I'm afraid. There's, a, there's some great footage of some chaps sat on a, a limber, like the one we have uh, at the front there. And um, one, one chap's filling uh, a hopper uh, with, with rounds, and it's cranked. So it's, it was a belt-filling machine in that respect. By, uh, by the Second World War and, and Korea, the, the ammunition was coming in filled um, boxes uh, ready from the factory. Uh, there was some filling in the field done, no doubt, but um, typically it was, it was in uh, ready-made lighters. Yes, sir. Could you talk about the variation in muzzles? I noticed that the earlier ones have yeah. got fairly simple muzzles. The latest ones have got a... Yeah, there's a, the, yeah. that's preliminarily, uh, pre predominantly a, f a flash hider. Um, that, that bulbous um, 
uh, shape of at the end of the, the later photographs, I think. But also the water jackets. In that one. So that, that's, that, um, that, that's the flash hider there. The water jackets, um, the, uh, I want to say corrugated, is that the correct term, Rich? Fluted. Fluted, there we are. The, the fluted water jacket, um, that was typically seen on, on uh, first world war guns. Um, second world war gun produc uh, production guns were typically a, a smooth, smooth. What about the canvas? What's that called? Uh, carrying when hot, oh, okay. um, essentially. Um, How long would the water last in the tank if it wasn't topped up? Uh, I believe it's 600 rounds it, bo it boils at. Uh, is that right, Rich? 600? Uh, yeah, so, um, so the, I think <coughs> what you've got is the, what is that? This barrel casing gets filled up here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this holds seven and a half pints, and that boils up after 600 rounds. So at the rapid rate. So uh, I was right. And then it, you lose a pint and a half of water for every thousand rounds. So at the rapid rate. So if you slow down your rate of fire, it will um, last forever, potentially, because it yeah. won't boil up. If you're firing at that rapid rate, which is two seconds between bursts and about every minute, <coughs> you'll lose that within 5,000 rounds of fire. And that's what it comes in, say. Yeah, so then the steam goes down the tube, around the front thing. Steam goes down that black tube into the can, which isn't necessarily to save water, it's to stop the steam giving your position away. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Was there anything on the front yeah. to tell you when it was running dry, or was it just you keep your arm? Yeah, you know, you, so between changing ammunition belts and stuff like that, if the number two is doing that, or they're having a rest, um, they'd be checking those water levels. But not too much, because um, if you have a look on the guns out there, that rear filling plug is brass, it's gonna, uh, you're not gonna be wanting to undo that very often because uh, it gets extremely hot at that point, uh, and you don't want a face full of steam if it is steaming up. So when you let the gun cool down, or you're going to change the barrel or something every 10,000 rounds, uh, then you'd be checking those water levels. Also worth mentioning that in Korea especially, they, they used a mix of antifreeze as well, yeah, didn't they? Yeah, they do. So they put glycol and stuff in there as yeah. well. To, um, they need to keep everything moving. Obviously, if that water freezes when that's boiling, either holds the barrel in place and recoil doesn't work, um, or just breaks the gun. Yes, sir. Uh, did the Germans have a similar thing with kettle pot? Did they use similar? Uh, I don't believe they did. Gun? No, I mean the, the Germans tended to use the, the MG42 and um, and and their their uh, more general purpose machine guns in a in a more section based role um, as a, as a direct suppression weapon. So they they tended not to. They did have the um, um, the Lafayette mount, um, which was for sustained fire. But that wasn't typically used for indirect fire. Is that purely because they didn't have enough well, weapons to, to, to they, they had They had the, the, an, enough weapons to do so, but I, I think it just wasn't within their doctrine. It wasn't something that they felt was necessary. They were suppressing at those kind of ranges, uh, you know, 4,000 yards outwards with, with mortars. Yeah. So the, the Germans pushed forward mortars and light artillery, naval vehicles, stuff like that, yeah. a lot further forward, um, whereas we supplement some of that with, with machine guns. They don't different kind of doctrine uh, doesn't necessarily have a reason, it's just a different way of doing things. I mean, the Germans have suffered because of that, or was it the storms here, it didn't matter? No, it's not. It, it's one of those sort of sub-levels of doctrine that would have um, had, a, had a tactical consequence in particular battles, but their, their mortars and stuff you know, oh. remedied that so much. Yeah. Yeah. I heard the story that when the gun went out of service, sorry, that that a trial was done where a gun was run continuously for a million, a million rounds and it did jam? So um, that's in the 60s uh, and one of the last armourers courses on the guns ran, and they put a single gun on a run for seven days and fired around seven million rounds. Seven million? Yeah, around seven million rounds uh, and they had minor breakages. So they did have minor breakages, um, but they ran it, kept it topped up with water, put new barrels in, just kept it running for seven days. I can assure you, yeah, we've fired the Vickers a lot. You do get bored at some point. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so you, you know, it, um, Do you think they use the screwdriver trick? It, it, possibly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they just uh, probably put those guys there. Um, you do get bored at some point. They got bored. We, one of the guys who's still around that did that. And it was seven million rounds. Seven million rounds, yeah, right. Yeah. What was the cost in uh, 
Of the gun? Around 115 pounds, if I remember rightly, uh, compared to a, to a Lewis, which is around 50 um, and or 75. By the end of the war, they've reduced it to, uh, if I remember right, yes, they've reduced it around to 95 pounds by doing less machining and uh, less kettling. So the, 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 you see the different the barrel casings, as you talked about here. That's the fluted one, that's a great war uh, era gun. The smooth barrel casing is a cheaper way of producing it. So it's things like that bring costs down to manufacture and also speed up the rate of manufacture as well. Yeah. Where were they made? By Vickers? All yeah. made by Vickers? Yeah. Yeah. What? Everything yeah. great. Everything Crayford. Oh, right. So they're the old Maxim and Nordenfeld factories that they turned over to machine guns. The Crayford factory was built in 1970, but they um, largely produced the and Kett. So uh, the Newcastle factory produces some parts, the factory in Bath produces some parts, but largely uh, they're, they're made in those two locations. Which is where the Victor's Harvest testing machine is yep. made. So they have cooked and built. It's, it's obviously easy to see where an artillery shell falls and then adjusts. What, was there a doctrine working with forward observers to bring a bullet, which is very hard to see at distance um, on the target? Uh, there's accounts in Korea with direct fire of, of them not being able to use the guns exactly for that because they didn't have any trace from the belts. Um, but in terms of uh, forward observers, I think so. Is that, is that No, right? they didn't. So um, they left those to, to mortars. Um, we were having this conversation yesterday, actually, in terms of there's a lot of trust. So you trust in the training, but people know what they're doing. Uh, you trust in the equipment that it's going to say what you, that it's going to do what you want it to do. And you trust in the science that proves that what happens you know, it's physics, it doesn't vary too much, but that's the you know, where you get the range tables, the slide rules and everything to turn around and say you know, that, that are lot, there are lots of numbers uh, that relate to how this works and officers would have, we've got a slide rule actually uh, that shows some of that stuff uh, upstairs, their calculations they would have to trust in. And there's a, one of the reasons that I think we don't do a lot of this stuff today is because there's that, or we want, or, we want to move to having forward observation officers, tracer rounds that are more effective, observation rounds and things like that. It's because the risk that we're prepared to accept is a lot less. So in terms of taking that machine gunnery transition all the way to, to how we you know, manage machine gunnery um, today is that actually the risk that we're able to accept around our elements of trust is a lot less. If your soldiers are in that bottom line. Yeah, 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 in overhead fire, yeah. I think I undersold just how simple that diagram makes it look. <laughs> yeah. um, can you talk a little bit about how you got the thing at Bisley that many of us have probably seen on YouTube? How you managed to arrange and get that actually happening? I'll save that for another day, okay. I'm afraid. Sorry. There's going to be a live stream. You're going to do a live stream Q&A, aren't you? Probably an hour and a bit exactly. in terms of the process of that. Um, but not easily <laughs> is the quick answer. Okay. Were there any attempts prior to the adoption of the Mark 8Z ammunition at increasing the range of the round for the figures? Uh, lots of attempts. I mean, the Mark 8Z ammunition that gets introduced takes 20 years to develop. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of the Small Arms Committee Minutes and the Ordnance Board memoranda are absolutely stacked full of all of the different ammunition trials and stuff of how we can eat that out. Um, but all things, all things in the 20s and 30s happen slowly until the end of the 30s when there's a war coming and everybody goes, Oh, well, just, we need to settle on something, let's get it done. So uh, that's where the Mark 8Z probably comes. Might have been able to get better. Uh, I don't think could have done, actually, looking at some of the stuff that happened just since it's too. Um, but they tried. They didn't dramatically, or they didn't make sufficient impact. So, you know, an extra 1,600 yards, people were happy to go, yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, the increase from, from 303 to Mark 8Z, is, it's significant, isn't it? It's a, it's 4,500 yards, which is it's three miles. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, it's half it's again. Yeah. There was another question at the back there. So, yeah, I don't know if it's familiar, but you were talking about like, pepper pots. So yes. Machine guns were a complement to the higher caliber weapons. Indeed. Uh, would you ever use machine guns on its own for an aerial fire? For what sort of fire, sorry? For indirect aerial fire. Aerial so fire? You said about pepper pots. Yeah. Machine guns complemented higher caliber oh, yeah. artillery. All right, yeah. Bits and pieces. Oh, so you mean, do you mean whether oh, it be used yeah, on its own? Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So that photograph of, um, from Operation Market Garden, that section of, of machine guns supporting uh, the crossing, um, 
I think that that particular barrage was 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 done with support of just mortars, I believe, when, from, from reading around it. So yeah, they definitely did fire on their own. I mean, those big pepper plot um, operations and barrages were, were all planned out for major operations like crossing the Rhine, et cetera, and, and Operation Market Garden had a number of them as well, but the, the term is more used around veritable and, and, and that, that kind of period. So largely, uh, yeah, pepper plot doesn't come in until about late 44, 45. Before that, machine gun battalions they're just, they're just doing, doing their, thing their own fire missions. Because they've got their own intrinsic mortars as well. Yeah. Yeah, largely machine guns set on the road, which means you can't see where that barrage is falling. It won't be visible because there's no, no big shell fire to give it away. Yes, sir? What was the ratio between the machine gun battalions and non-infantry battalions? Uh, one to nine. So one machine gun battalion supporting uh, nine infantry battalions because one battalion per division, nine infantry battalions per division. There you go. It's actually the same number of guns as we had in the Great War. It's the same number of guns as we had at any other point in the British service. And like, other than Korea, we start to get six guns per battalion rather than before. So we just change. We don't increase the numbers. We just change how we use them. Any other questions? No? Great. Uh, should, we introduce, uh, should we introduce Robbie? And he can show his documentaries before yes, the next talk. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, introduce my colleague at the back there, Rob. Um, Rob has made a series of really great documentaries about uh, Vickers, um, uh, sorry, machine gun corps um, personnel that won the Victoria Cross during uh, the First World War. So Rob, do you want to come up and we'll, we'll do some technical wizardry? They're right there. Okay. All right. If you want to see those documentaries, they're running on a screen outside. Um, what we also have able to run on that screen is, if you didn't haven't seen it, is a 20 minute that Adam put together on the busy shoot. So um, everybody's in the room that does anything till we film. Um, so uh, if you, you know, we, we talked about this busy shoot that we did two weeks ago quite a bit. Uh, there were 16 big machine guns firing, 16,000 rounds of ammunition. It's the biggest shoot that's run since 2002. Um, it's the biggest civilian run shoot ever. Uh, and it just shows you the dramatic firepower of the machine guns. Yeah, the, the, that, that's what it's there for. It's there to do two things. Dramatic firepower. Um, how you interpret that is entirely up to the tool. You know, I can't make you interpret that in a enjoyable or brief, you know, brief form. It, it's just we awesome definitely have both. from an awe-inspiring kind of way. Um, and you know, we produce a 20-minute documentary around that. Uh, Adam has, which uh, you can see online as well, but it's going to run on that screen <coughs> sort of, uh, around what, what we produce as well. Okay. Excellent. And then the next, so then the next talk is going to run at 2 o'clock, and that is Paul Macro talking about uh, men's motorcycles and machine guns in Northwest Frontier. So, actually, something you know, very niche, but something we haven't covered because nobody's lent us a motorcycle in the um, So, we cover it in, in PowerPoint. Right? Like we couldn't cover indirect fire today because the buildings would get. Yeah, Chelsea way. wouldn't like it, would they? <laughs> Thank you. This is the perfect room for your videos. Why? why are they